healthy women, Lord, who go out and reproduce other healthy women, Lord, and healthy children, Lord. Pour your spirit out on me, Lord. Take away all of my words, Lord. Replace them, Lord, with your words, Lord. Send your spirit to teach us, Lord, to convict us and convince us, Lord, and exhort us. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to do a study in the book of Titus. We're starting in Titus 1. So if you want to turn there, we're going to cover all of chapter 1. And let's begin. The theme that I came up with is Titus becoming a healthy woman of God. And so the theme verse, if you would, is going to be Titus 1.9. And it says, holding fast, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So the church in Crete is uh, where Titus is. The church, there's some churches being planted. It's a new church. Uh, Titus being a convert of Paul. He calls him a true son in the faith. So he's sending Titus on and he's writing Titus this letter. And so the church in Crete was not healthy. It was not a sound church and it was lacking. And Paul is sending Titus this letter to set in order the things that are lacking. And in just an application for us is there, there are many unhealthy men and women in the church today. And we can learn so much from this book because we want to be spiritually healthy. And so the title of today's message is Six Fuzzy Chicks, A Frisky Puppy, and A Great Father Who Loves Us. So without further ado, starting in verse 1, we'll go verse by verse to the end. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness. So Paul, he's telling us, I'm the writer of this letter. And he starts at the very beginning just by calling himself a bondservant. A bondservant, and the Greek word was doulos. I'm sure that you've heard this word, but if not, it's the Greek word D O U. L-O-S, and it's from the Greek word D-E-O, and that word means to bind. In the original meaning, it was used to describe the lowest term of, uh, on the scale of servitude. It also came to mean one who gives himself to another for the will of God. And it became the most common and general word of a servant without any idea of bondage later on. But in calling himself a bond servant, he is saying, I am a slave of Jesus Christ in Romans 1. Paul intimates that he was formerly a bond slave of Satan. But since Christ bought him by his blood, he was now a willing slave bound to his new master, Jesus Christ. So Paul wants us to know this about him. He doesn't say, Paul, the leader of the church, Paul, the president, Paul. No, he calls him a, himself a slave. I'm a slave of Christ. And this is his first and foremost ministry. He says, I'm a slave of Christ. And this has to be our first ministry. Our primary goal is to serve the Lord by worshiping him, by praising him, by walking with him, and by listening to his voice. Because there's so many things that are competing for our ears and for our eyes and for our hearts. Man, I serve the Lord, he's saying. And that is so true for us. We serve the Lord. We don't serve man. We're not slaves of man. We're slaves of God. We're slaves of Jesus Christ. Um, this word for slave is, is also very, very pointedly, it's, it's a slave by choice. And it's each day, each really moment, we're making a choice. I serve you, Lord. I have no will of my own. 
as slave. A slave didn't have a will of his own. He had the will of his master. We have no will. My will is to do the will of the Father. That's what Jesus said. And as women, we're slaves of Christ. We serve our husbands first, right? Our children, then the church, um, or the ministry that God called us to. And, and it's a high calling to be a wife. It's a high calling to be a mother. It's a high calling to be a slave of Christ. And he uses the most humble term to describe himself. Um, then next, Paul describes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle literally means sent one. So Paul was sent. He was a messenger sent by Jesus Christ he was firm. He was so firm in his calling um, in the body of Christ. And I, and I just want to um, exhort us to be firm in our calling, know what God called us to do. He was firm, like, I'm a slave of Christ, and I love being a slave of Christ. Um, it's so freeing. Uh, according to the faith of God's elect, he says, Paul is being sent to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. We always want to be growing in our walk with the Lord, and that's why Paul is sending. I want to grow you in your walk and in your faith with the Lord. Uh, Philippians 3.10 says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Much like I was, I was looking, my rose bush is blooming, but the buds are just coming on and they're super tight. Paul is describing a walk. He wants us to flourish, to go from bud to bloom in our walk and in our knowledge of him. But this is, is the bud is just the beginning. God wants us to fully flourish in our faith and knowledge of him. He wants us to take us from elementary school to middle school to high school to college and beyond. Um, but as leaders, right, I can't take you further than I've gone. So I just want to encourage you with that. We have to learn the word of God. And in today, um, hurry up, pastor. I got places to go. Let's get this message over with. Um, I, I'm giving, shh, let's go, make it snappy. Uh, and, but yet, somehow we can sit and scroll for hours, but it's, Come on, pastor, let's get on with this word. You know, so we have to get our priorities straight in this fast-paced uh, world. We, we want to sit at Jesus' feet, and we have to be disciplined. And if that means, like, throwing this, like, out the window for a couple of days, we should do it, right? We want to learn the word of God. We want to memorize the word of God. We want to hide the word in our hearts. We want to cling to it with everything we have. Here's what he says. He wants us to hold fast to this word of life, because the deceiver is propagating seed. It looks so close to the truth that we, if possible, as the elect, can even be uh, swayed into believing a lie if we are not very careful. Satan scatters seed, and I was reminded of one time um, Ray and I hired a, a, a landscape where we were going on vacation. We hired him, come do some mulch, and, and, and he laid his mulch. And uh, we got home from a few days. You cannot believe, mulch is like to, to cover the weeds, to keep the weeds. I don't know what he put down, but we came home and there were weeds from one end of our garden to another. And it just reminded me of that worse. An enemy has done this. And then that's what he does. You don't know, if you don't know what's being put down, anything can, it can grow in that soil. And we need to have discernment to be able to detect false doctrine. <clears throat> um, and he says, for the elect, he says, according to the faith of God's elect. This is a Greek word, E-K-L-E-K-T-O-S, the elect. It means chosen. Well, how can I know if God chose me for eternal life? Well, ask yourself, am I following him? Have I given my life to him? Have I surrendered to him? Then I'm chosen. Um, in, in, is in acknowledgement of the truth, which leads to godliness, Paul, he stood for godly living. All truth, all truth is found in the Bible. The Bible is only filled with truth. Much of science or psychology may be true. It might be admirable, but 
it won't save a soul from hell, right? It will not lead to a godly life. It is not truth that is in accord with godliness. Many people will shout, go to counseling, but what we really need to be shouting is repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Submit to God, resist the devil, right? And he will flee from you because the devil has a doctrine and it's being propagated in the world and it's seeping into the church, right? I know that the Bible says in Proverbs, godly counsel is wise. It's wise to get godly counsel, right? And I'm not saying not to do that. But what I'm saying, sometimes we just need to tell people to repent. Repent of your sin. You don't need to get counseling for that sin. You need to repent of it. Titus 1, 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. The hope of eternal life. Paul is writing to Titus a serious word here, and it's a word that we have to grab hold of and not let go. We have hope. God promised us eternal life, and the word that we preach and the word that we teach, the message of the gospel, it's not to make us have a better life here. It might. It can, and it does, but it's not our primary concern. The gospel isn't to make a bad person good, although it does. The gospel message is about eternal life, and we will all live for eternity, but our eternal destination will be very, very different. It won't all be the same. Everyone doesn't go to heaven, right? Only those who trust in Jesus Christ and follow him and repent of their sin. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Frances Havergal, a, a, an amazing woman of God, she wrote over to thousands of hymns if, and um. She says in her devotional, and I love this devotional, it's called Royal Chambers. On this verse, speaking of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ? A very severe test, you might say. I cannot help that. I can only tell you what God says. I cannot reverse it, and you cannot alter it. So then, if old things have not passed away in your life, and if you are not a new creature, if you are born again and you're not altogether different in your heart, in your life, in your love, and in your aim, you're not in Christ. Don't deceive yourself. Galatians 6.15 says, For in Christ, in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So all of our outward things that we might want to do cannot work our way to heaven, right? Um, the, the, the circumcision, oh, I'm circumcised. No, it doesn't matter. That, that avails us nothing. I work. I, you should see all that I do in the community. It avails us nothing, right? Nothing that we do outwardly can earn us favor with God. Many people in that day, they wanted to do good works. They wanted to be seen by man. They wanted the accolades of man, and they want the praises of man. Things are no different today, and I will be the first to tell you, the praise of man feels wonderful. I want the praises of man in my flesh. It pampers my flesh. It feels good. But Romans 8 at 8 says, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Proverbs 29, 25 says that the fear of man brings a snare. Whoever trusts in the Lord will be safe. So we have to be so careful that we're not uh, seeking the praises of man. Um, look at the caterpillar. She's crawling with, with, uh, on, the, on the ground, and suddenly, in an instant, she is made a new creation. We want old things to pass away, our old life, uh, that old man uh, with its desires and, and, and lusts, right? We want that passed away. Verse 3 says, But has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. In due time, in due season, uh, this word, due time, uh, it meant a limited time. It meant an opportune time. It meant fixed 
and a definite time, in due time, was manifested. It was revealed, his word, through the preaching. There was a time like no other when the Roman Empire was thriving. It was, it was safe to travel, um, and it made sharing the gospel relatively easy and safe. So just to apply this to our own lives uh, right in the day that we live in, uh, what season are we living in? We're living in a time like no other. God has called us to this day and this time in 2022. Um, for such a time as this, hearts are desperately seeking a savior. They're desperate to hear hope. They desperately need a rescuer, right? And we have that hope um, that, that nothing, science cannot offer hope, right? It not, psychology cannot offer hope. We have the hope of Jesus Christ. Preaching, the word preaching, has in due time manifested his word through preaching. It's the Greek word, K-E-R-Y-G-M-A. And in the Greek, it was used to describe that which was proclaimed like by a town crier or a herald. A town crier or a herald was someone employed by the town to make a public announcement, right? We have been called and sent. We're sent ones from Christ to preach a message to a dying world, a lost and hopeless world. We have hope. Each one of us has been given this calling, right? We have good news to announce and proclaim and to shout it from the rooftops that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And as Paul would say, I would say, and of whom I was chief sinner. He died on an old rugged cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And if we'll repent of our sin and we will turn and follow Jesus, he will pay that penalty. And on judgment day, God will not see our sin, but the blood of his precious son. And Jesus died but he didn't stay dead, right? He rose again on the third day. And this is what assures us of our eternal security, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He proved that death could not hold him. And he overcame death just as we will because he first overcame. So shall we. The sting of sin is death. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, at just the right time, he has revealed this message, which we announce to everyone, and it is by the command of God our Savior that you and I have been entrusted with this work for him. Verse 4. To Titus, Paul gets to who he is writing to. He's writing to Titus, a true son in our common faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, I wanted to tell you what Titus meant. The name Titus in the Strong's Concordance says it means a nurse. So I get the idea that Titus has been tasked somewhat like what we would consider a traveling nurse. He is going from church to church in its baby stages, and there's new believers that are gathering together, and they need sound doctrine and sound leadership. Psalm 91.4 says, He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Well, Paul is writing to exhort Titus to stand in the truth and to teach the church to hold fast to the words of sound doctrine. Matthew 23, 37 says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as hens gather her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Well, this word here, uh, as we move to uh, verse 4, Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from the Father, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this reason, I left you in Crete 
that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Well, I was walking in my neighborhood um, this past week, in, and I, I saw uh, some baby chicks, six fuzzy chicks. And so I, I got to thinking, you know, um, what a beautiful application uh, it was um, to Paul and what he is saying here to Titus. So if Noreen will cue this video, I want you to see this in, in uh We'll go on from there. So I love that so much because as I approached the baby chicks, uh, they were just perfectly happy just to, to be grazing in the grass. But as I approached, uh, dad was calling them and they came when, when he called. And, it, and I love that picture so much. Um, Titus is exhorting. He is called to exhort the church. And Titus had been tasked with a very, very difficult job to do. <clears throat> Paul knew he is tasking Titus with a very challenging job. And he sent this letter of instruction and encouragement. And so I wanted to point out, Paul could trust Titus. He knew that Titus had a good rapport. He knew he had a good reputation, and so he was trusting Titus um, to set things in order. Uh, when Paul, he had hard things to be done, he sent Titus. And so I just wanted to think about that. You know, can the Lord trust us, you and I, uh, to do hard things? Even though they are challenging, we need to be ready. Paul uh, in verse 4, he says, Paul is sending a prayer forward, if you would, grace, mercy, and peace. And so I wanted to uh, say we need God's grace. We need God's mercy in order to have God's peace. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Sometimes we feel courageous. Sometimes uh, we feel strong enough um, to scale a wall, and, and sometimes not. And it's those times that we need God's grace, mercy, and peace. Because God's peace leads to God's power, power to do hard things. And so just moving on, uh, taking a look at verse 5. For this reason, I sent you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking. The word set in order is such an interesting Greek word, and it's the word E-P-I-D-I-O-R-T-H-O-O. -O. So I wanted you to see the word ortho in there. So it's made up of three Greek words, E-P-I, D-I, and then the, the last one, ortho. And I, I love uh, the picture. Ortho is where we get our word orthopedic. An orthopedic doctor sets broken bones. When my older son played football, I got that dreadful phone call. Mrs. Bolas, we need you to come to the field. Uh, Wayne is okay, but we think he broke his arm. Ugh. 
It was horrible. I, 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 I hurry up. I get there. Uh, his arm was literally crooked. The bone was sticking out. Um, well, he needed to go to an orthopedic doctor and get that bone set right because otherwise it would be crooked. His arm was crooked. Well, this phrase here, he needs, uh, he's sending Titus to set in order the things that are lacking, and it's a medical term, and it was applied to the setting of a crooked limb, and I love that. There were broken things. There were crooked things that had to be set straight in the congregations of Crete. One way of setting things straight was to appoint elders. Uh, an elder, which he moves on to say, set the things that are in order, set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I command you. An elder is a spiritual leader. Paul's going to tell us in the following verses some qualifications of an elder. It's not an exhaustive list, um, but what you're going to find is leadership has nothing to do with being an eloquent speaker. It's not about going to seminary. It's not about having a prestigious job in the community. It has nothing to do with a man being a man of influence um, because he makes a lot of money or because he does good work in the community. Verse 6, he tells us, he goes on to say the qualifications. If a man, if a man is blameless. And so I want to point that out, that he doesn't say if a man and woman, because men are called to lead the church. It's just God's order and way of setting things in the church. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife. The idea is of a one-woman man. It doesn't mean that the leader must be married. Um, if that were the case, then both Jesus and Paul would have been disqualified from leadership. Nor is it the idea that a leader could never remarry um, if his wife passed away or if he was biblically divorced. The idea is that a leader has his focus upon one woman, the, that being his wife. Having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. The leader must have raised his children well. His ability to lead the family of God has to be first demonstrated by his ability to lead his own children, right? <clears throat> Verse 7 says, for a bishop, a bishop in the Greek, it meant an overseer. So someone who's overseeing the church, he must be blameless, Blameless in the Greek, this word literally meant nothing to take hold of. There must be nothing in the life of a leader that others can take hold of and attack his life or attack the church. As a steward of God, and this is important because as a steward of God's house, he cannot be self-willed, not quick-tempered, it says, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Verse 8, but be hospitable. A lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, and self-controlled. Now, these words that Paul is writing to Titus, we definitely covered in depth in um, our study of Timothy. So I'm not going to go into what each one of these means, but I do still love to point out the word hospitable. And it means loving strangers, and foreigners, welcoming them into your heart and maybe even into your home for dinner. Verse 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. This is the theme verse of the book for Titus. Uh, here, holding fast, clinging and cleaving, and holding on for dear life. That is what hold fast means. To cleave, to cling to. I have a frisky puppy. His name is Faithful. And I love using him um, as a demonstration, if you would. Um, and when I give him a stuffed animal... He will hold on to it for dear life. And I was recently visiting um, my older son. He just got a puppy. And so if Noreen wants to show that, it was adorable. She's adorable. She was holding on to this stuffed animal. She was not letting go. Um, 
if Camden was trying to get it from her, she was like, nope, I am not giving this up. I want it, it's mine, and I'm holding on to it, and you're not going to get it. And I thought this was such a great spiritual analogy for us. You know, she didn't look at how big her opponent was. She wasn't looking at um, the size of this obstacle um, that she was up against. She didn't take into consideration his physical appearance into her calculation. She's like, that's mine. I'm not giving it up. Um, And she kept her eyes on the prize. She's like, this toy belongs to me. Well, in the like manner, we have to hold on to sound words in verse 9 holding fast the faithful word, the faithful word, the word of God that's trusted, it's reliable, and we can bank on it, everything. We can stake our life on the faithful word of God, and we have to, and we must. We must cling to the word that God has given us. We must hold on to his sound words, holding fast. It says, Hold fast to the word that you have been taught so you may be able, it says, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Well, this word be able, it's the Greek word D-Y-N-A-T-O-S. It is where we get our English word for dynamite. Hold fast to the word so that you will be able to have explosive power, explosive might and strength. How? By sound doctrine. By sound doctrine to exhort and convict those who contradict. Listen to this word sound. It's in in the Greek H-Y-G-I-E-S, and it's where we get our English word for hygiene. It was used throughout the Gospels to speak of making sick people whole. The word literally means to be healthy. We need to become healthy women of God using this sound doctrine. Within the church and without, people are not whole and they are broken and and maybe that describes you this morning broken limping unhealthy listen to the root word of of that word sound it means it's uh, the greek word a u x a n o and it, it literally means to cause growth to increase and to become greater inwardly it's spoken of inward christian growth and broken people are hurting they're hiding they're limping, they're pretending, and in that, they're grabbing on to false doctrine, feel-good doctrine, doctrine that is not doctrine at all. And women, as women, we are often swayed by our emotions and our feelings, and in that, we are being attacked by the destroyer of our souls. Where do you run to when you're down, when you're scared, when you're being intimidated. Just like those six fuzzy chicks, they ran. They ran straight to their father. We need to run to our faithful father. When God has given you a difficult task, a difficult husband, a difficult child, we have to run to our faithful father who knows what's best for us, who is looking out for us. He can see further than we can. And, and, and you know, when I stumbled upon those chicks, who could resist them, right? But the papa, that father, saw me before I saw him. He, he saw me coming. And when I kept coming, as I encroached on their territory, I was a little too close for his comfort. He called them right up close. He said, come here, and they scurried to their dad. Considering things from their perspective, I being much bigger, I was um, intimidating. They should feel intimidated. I was bigger than them. Well, when we're feeling intimidated, when we're facing difficult circumstances that are so much bigger than we are, where do we turn? We can learn from the chicks who ran to their father. They didn't run away. 
when I came, they didn't scatter all in direction, all different directions. They didn't stay put either. They didn't try to fight me and take me on themselves. They didn't ask each other, what should we do? They ran to their father. And when we're tasked with that difficulty, situations, people, even if we're dealing with false doctrine and misapplication, we have to run to the father. Paul has given Titus a very difficult task. He needs to set in order and straighten out what is crooked in people that he is close to. Brothers and sisters, friends and family alike in the body of Christ. Well, the most challenging people um, for us to talk to are those that are closest to us. Well, Paul is encouraging Titus, hold on to sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, the word of God that you've been taught. That is how you must exhort them. The word of God that's sound, that's healthy, that's able to convict in and of itself is able to convict a person that they are going astray. It is able to convict the sinner of their sin. The word of God is wholly sufficient to show error of a person who is living contrary to the word of God. And Paul is telling Titus, he's telling us, whether we're exhorting, whether we're rebuking, whether we're counseling, whether we're discipling a sister that we love, hold fast to the faithful word. The word of God can be trusted. Sound doctrine brings conviction. Hold fast to it. Don't sway off of it. And, and why? Why is that? And I, I feel that the Lord showed me this verse. Philemon 1.14 says, but without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. Uh, uh, Paul was writing to um, file, uh, a letter in asking Onesimus to be welcomed back. But he, couldn't, he didn't want to do that unless it was by voluntary, oh, please come back. What he's saying is that he says that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. We can't force people to change, Right? We can't compel them to do what the word says. And so when your closest friends and your closest family don't want sound doctrine, they don't want to hear healthy truths, they want to continuously turn to do things their own way, the crooked way, the broken way that's not working. When you continuously walk on a broken ankle and it continuously gets weaker and weaker, it's not getting better, is it? It's not going to get stronger. They want to keep going that same way. And they're becoming weaker and weaker. It has to be set straight, right? If nothing changes, nothing changes, right? And in those times that they're not receiving sound doctrine, that they're not hearing us, that they're not listening to the word, they're not being prompted, the unholy trinity the unholy trinity wants to bring the three deadly Ds, doubt, discouragement, and defeat. We can be so tempted to be down and discouraged and question our call. Did God really tell me to do this? Did God really tell me to say this? Did God really call me to be married to this man? Did God really call me to, to, to do this? Let this solidify your call. You are called. <laughs> you do have an important message. You can't compel them to come. They have to come voluntarily to submit to the word of God. So don't doubt your call. Don't doubt what, what God is telling you. James 1.6 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Ask God for wisdom. Speak his truth. Don't be tossed around in a sea of uncertainty. Doubt brings discouragement, and a discouraged Christian is useless because then discouragement leads to defeat. Verse 10, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, deceivers. This word deceivers, Paul, Paul is warning him, there's deceivers in the church. Here's the Greek word, P-H-R-E-N-A-P. A-T-E-S. Here's what this word means. To mislead the mind. 
to cause to roam from the truth, to wander from the place of safety, to seduce and to go astray. The discerning of spirits is a gift that we should ask the Lord for. In um, 1 Corinthians 14, it says, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts. We should desire spiritual gifts. The discerning of spirits is a spiritual gift, and it's the ability to tell the difference between true and false doctrine, discerning what is true and real and what is falsely being said to us, what are you listening to? And it is discerning of, discerning of spirits is a must have in the church and in the day that we live in. The gift of discernment is from the Holy Spirit and it is rapidly disappearing. Mm. A few facts about the deceiver. Who's this deceiver, right? But the enemy of our soul, Satan. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan appears as an angel of light. He makes bad things good, y'all. Genesis 2, 16 through 3, 5. He deceives with a false and tempting message. 1 Kings 22, verse 21 through 23, and 2 Chronicles 18, 20 through 22. There can be lying spirits in the mouth of prophets. Satan... Matthew 16, 23, can speak right after God speaks. Did you hear that? Satan can speak right after God speaks. Acts 13, 6 through 12, and 16, 16. Sometimes people who seem to say the right things are really from the devil. 1 John 4, 1 through 3. It is important to test the word of anyone who claims to speak from God. Very important. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10 and Revelation 13, 11 through 14. Satan can work deceiving miracles. Jude 4. The devil will try to infiltrate the church with false teachers how we need the gift of discernment in the church today, sisters, right? Verse 11 of Titus, getting back to our main verses, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. In, in the King James Version, I love, it's called filthy lucre. You know what it meant? It means to gain, and many times we're tempted, and I'm just trying to apply this uh, in, in today, even back then, um, many times we're tempted to be silenced or censor the word of God so that we can gain someone's liking, someone's approval or their following. We don't want to hurt their feelings after all. We need to be more concerned about the Lord's feelings, right? How does he feel? And in numbers, don't impress God. You speak the truth and let the chips fall where they may, right? We want a humble heart that obeys the Lord. Uh, Micah 6, 8, this is what he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? Titus 1, verse 12 through 16 says, as we close up, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are all liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So to close up and sum up, Paul did not say to Titus, he did not say, Cretans are all liars and cheats and gluttons with one of the most worst reputations of any group in the Roman Empire. 
you should look for an easier group to work with. He didn't say that, did he? No. He said, I know how bad they are. Now, go out and change them with the power of Jesus Christ and for his glory. And so I want to exhort all of us. The word of God is living in Hebrews 4.12. It is powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, and it cuts to divide soul and spirit, bones and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wield your sword, my sisters, and wield it, and don't be ashamed of it. Don't back down from it. Don't censor it. Let it have its free course, and it will exhort and convict and convince and do what it was intended to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, um, for the privilege and for the honor, Lord, of being entrusted with your word, Father. And you sent us, Lord, to this time, this place, in this season, Lord, a season that is, is, it could be fleeting in a vapor. It could be gone, Lord, and you're coming back. Let us be, Lord, on the lookout, Lord, for that. Let us use our time so wisely. Let us make the most of every opportunity, Lord, those divine appointments that you've given us, Lord, and those family members you've selected, Lord, hand-chosen for us uh, to be related to, Lord, and the ministries that you've called us, Lord, and this holy word, Lord, we thank you for it, Lord. Um, Help us, Lord, to be bold, Lord. Help us, Lord, uh, to Uh, speak in your name, Lord, for this day and this season and at this time, Father. Thank you for the great honor and privilege, Lord. Help us, Lord, um, in those areas, Lord, that you know that we're weak in, Lord. We need your help, Lord. We desperately need you, Father, Um, and you won't leave us, Lord. Help us run to you, Lord, just like those baby chicks, Father, when we need um, help, when we need courage, Lord, when we're afraid. Lord, let us not be intimidated and backing down from the devil who wants to silence us, Lord. Let us just cling to you and look to you, Father. We love you and praise your name. Amen. And we're just going to close with one.